Hello everyone, um, thanks to Andy, Andrew and Simon for organising and allowing me to speak. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Matt Hobbs and I'm the Head of Front End um, at Government Digital Service or uh, GDS as we know. And I'm here to speak to you about bringing HTTP2 to gov.uk. Uh, for those of you uh, who haven't heard of GDS, uh, we're a central government department that has created and maintains a number of government services. But what we're primarily known for is building and maintaining gov.uk. Uh, gov.uk is the website for the UK government. It's the best place to find policy, announcements, uh, information about the government and guidance for citizens. Uh, since 2012, it has replaced 1,884 government websites with just one to become the home of all central government's online content and services. And it's what the rest of this talks about. Um, so just a bit of a caveat before I start, all the work that I mentioned here um, and presenting was done before the current um, coronavirus outbreak. So before I delve into the details, um, what is HTTP2 or H2 for short? So H2 is the latest stable version of the HTTP protocol, although HTTP3 is in the works. Um, H2 comes with a number of performance improvements over its predecessor, HTTP 1.1. These include uh, minimizing the protocol overhead via the compression of headers using HPAC header compression, uh, reducing network latency and the use of request and response multiplexing streams over a single TCP connection and more control over the prioritization of assets and the order in which they are downloaded and the ability to server push. So essentially the server is pushing an asset to the browser's cache without it having to request it. So where did it all begin? Uh, what prompted us to enable H2 in the first place? Well, there are many articles on the web that talk about the performance improvements H2 can bring to a website. And all you need to do is enable it. A magic bullet to solve all performance problems? Maybe, I don't think so. So, and if you happen to use Google Lighthouse for auditing your site performance, uh, you may have seen something similar to this under best practices. Um, here we see 14 past audits. This gives you a score of 93%. To add that missing 7% and reach the magic 100% score, you just need to enable H2. Simple. And here's the missing 7% that I'm talking about as seen here in the Lighthouse version five score weighting spreadsheet. So uh, to make the case for enabling H2 on gov.uk, I pulled together a 10 page report on what it is, uh, the advantages it brings and how we could enable it and roll it out. And the very last sentence um, and in the report of the report, I write um, on examining all the evidence, I cannot see any downsides to enabling this protocol on our Fastly CDN layer. As the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. So after all the positivity of the report and everything I've been reading about, uh, we were ready to enable it. But first, uh, how do we test to see what difference it makes? So I selected five pages to test. Um, each had slightly different content and different templates that we used. Um, I tested both on simulated devices and real devices. Um, connection speed ranged from native uh, down to 3G slow. Uh, we used the following tools to measure uh, performance, uh, web page test, speed curve, site speed IO and Lighthouse. And once these tests were run uh, for HTTP 1.1, um, I contacted Fastly support to enable H2 on the domain and then eagerly awaited the results. The results weren't at all what I expected. Um, a brief explanation of this graph. So here you see the difference between HTTP 1.1 and H2 results. Um, any bar that is above the x-axis is actually worse for HTTP2. So for example, on the home page, the first visual change was 149 milliseconds slower on H2 than HTTP 1.1. And the pattern repeated itself across different setups and different tools. Uh, here you see an example where H2 was actually quicker for one of the pages as seen in the bar chart to the far right where all the bars are below the x-axis. I even tried comparing uh, using a warm cache um, rather than a cold cache, and which is where you move through the home page to the page to populate the cache 
uh, before we get in that, to that page. Uh, and many of the results were the same. Here on a 3G connection, H2 starts off really well and then stagnates for two seconds against HTTP 1.1. The summary page made for a disappointing read. Um, in many test cases, HTTP 1.1 actually performed better um, than H2 under the synthetic tests I've chosen. Unless you're on a, an iPhone 5C on a 4G connection, where performance actually improved across most pages for some reason. So what exactly was happening? Um, we decided to leave on H2 um, for around about a month so we could investigate the issue further. We could see that H2 was enabled on the server and the browser was seeing it. Uh, we had a reduced number of connection IDs. So a fewer number of TCP connections were being opened. Uh, in the half files, we could see the multiplexing of files over a single TCP connection. HTTP 1.1 on the left, uh, files are requested and downloaded uh, one after the other, creating a, a stepped sloping graph. Uh, H2 on the right, uh, a vertical line shows almost all the files are requested essentially at the same time. We could see that HPAC header compression was working as expected. Um, compression can be seen here um, after the space savings. 0% um, for HTTP 1.1 as expected and 68% for H2. So I had a theory about what the issue was. Uh, we actually had and still have um, a shard domain. Uh, this is a throwback to a best practice for improving performance on HTTP 1.1. Since a browser usually only opens six TCP connections to a single domain, using a second domain opens more connections. So more parallel connections in theory could result in a quicker page load. So for gov.uk, only the HTML is uh, served from the origin or www.gov.uk. All other assets, the CSS, the JavaScript, the images and the fonts are all loaded from the assets domain. Now looking at a web page test waterfall chart, you can actually see the second TCP connection being established here highlighted in red. Um, all the CSS and JavaScript and images were waiting on this connection to establish. So maybe this was the issue and maybe this was causing the issue. So how do we reduce the time for the second TCP connection to establish? There were three possible solutions I could see to fix this issue. The first was the pre-connect hint header. Um, the theory being, if the browser can connect to the assets domain earlier, it won't be waiting as long when assets are needed, um, since the connection has already been established and negotiated by the HTML. The second was H2, uh, connection coalescing. Uh, connection coalescing allows a browser to use the same TCP connection to transfer data from multiple domains, assuming both domains um, have similar properties like IP address and SSL certificate. If working properly, there'd be really very little need for the second TCP connection. The third solution was remove the need for the assets domain for static assets. Um, the reason for this is by serving everything from www.gov.uk, there'd be no wait time to download the assets since the connection has already been established while downloading the HTML. So I even asked um, Pat Meenan, creator of Webpage Test at London WebPerf in December 2018 for his thoughts. And as you can see in the screenshot from a video uh, from them as proof. So after trying on and off for a number of weeks to try and fix the issue with no success, we took the decision to disable H2, um, knowing that enabling it negatively impacted performance for our users, especially those on slow mobile connections, left us with no option really. So we left it for a while. Um, there have been a few other things going on in government recently, so H2 really wasn't a top priority. In December, um, I received a question off the back of my how to read a web page test blog post. Um, Yulia Lakaban, who usually attends the event and may be watching, um, asked a question about an image download happening in one of the blog posts waterfall charts. It was this image, um, fairly unremarkable at first sight. It's request number three, uh, the red arrow, that really stands out. Uh, a single image that looks to be out of place compared to the rest of the images. And if you look at the full uh, view, 
um, of all the assets specialized, it gets even weirder. So here you have an image labeled one, um, actually downloading from the assets domain before the connection to the assets domain has actually been negotiated, labeled number two. So how is that possible? So upon investigation, it turns out to be H2 connection coalescing. Something I was certain wasn't happening in the initial trial, it turns out it was happening. Um, this is a connection view for the test where each row um, shows a separate TCP connection. On connection number one, you may just be able to make out there's two URLs. You've got www.gov.uk and then you have the assets domain. So this signifies that the two domains have coalesced over a single TCP connection. Once a TCP, once the connection is established, the browser is downloading a single image from the assets domain while it's still allowed to do so. And another pattern this connection view shows is that the HTML and the images are only downloaded on connection number one, and the CSS and JavaScript and fonts are only downloaded on connection number two. So that's quite unusual. So what's happening there? It turns out we were using something called sub-resource integrity for both our JavaScript and our CSS. So sub-resource integrity is a security feature that is used to stop third-party code that has been modified from executing on your site. So uh, you can see an integrity attribute with a file hash um, as seen in the code. Um, if the hash in the attribute and the file hash of the asset being downloaded by the browser don't match, the file won't execute because it, it, it's almost like the, the code has been modified. So also one of the requirements of sub-resource integrity is that the cross origin attribute must be used as seen in the code as well. So this attribute provides support for cross origin resource sharing, of course. By setting this attribute to anonymous, we're essentially forcing both the CSS and the JavaScript to be downloaded on the second TCP connection. This is because an anonymous connection means that there will be no exchange of user credentials via cookies, client side SSL certificates or HTTP authentication, unless on the same origin. The second anonymous connection needed to be established before anything could be downloaded. So all of our CSS, which is render blocking, is waiting on this connection to be established. In the exam example seen here, if the CSS and the JavaScript were allowed to use a credential connection, e.g. the one already established uh, to the origin, we could bring these downloads forwards by 750 milliseconds. But rather than removing sub-resource integrity, is there an alternative to uh, the anonymous value? Looking at the Bazilla Developer Network documentation, there is. Uh, the use credentials value allows the request for assets to include a creden credentialed information. So following our RFC process for um, making changes to gov.uk, I wrote an RFC. Um, I waited with comments and feedback before proceeding uh, with the anonymous uh, to use credentials change. The change was made on a single application on our integration server. Unfortunately, it didn't quite go as expected. Um, so all the CSS and the JavaScript on the pages fail, um, served by that application failed to load. Um, looking at the console, uh, it was, we could quickly see why. Uh, cross origin resource sharing. We had a cause error. Now it can't, when it comes to cause, um, it always pays to read the fine print. It's a subject that I think I understand until I read something new, then I realize I don't understand it at all. Um, taking a closer look at the fetch specifications under cause protocol and credentials, row five states that if credentials mode is set to include or use credentials, then access control allow origin cannot be star. So a simplified set, uh, explanation of the access control allow origin header is, it is used to tell a browser where the resource being requested can be used. So for example, if an asset is being requested from a domain where this header is set to star um, or the requested domain isn't listed, um, you'll get a cause error. So the access, uh, access control allow origin header was added to gov.uk to allow our web fonts to be viewed correctly in all browsers when it was served from the cross origin assets domain. But instead of the header only being added for the font files, they were being added to all assets from the domain. So when you think about it, 
you can see why the spec is written that way. So access control allow origin star is allowing a resource to be accessed by any domain. Uh, cross origin use credentials is basically saying allow this fetch to happen on a connection that can transfer connect credentials information about that domain. So once you combine the two, that doesn't sound particularly secure. So at this point, I decided that the next and easiest step would be to remove some resource integrity from our CSS and our JavaScript, so from the assets domain. And since we weren't using it in the way that was intended, um, e.g. for scripts hosted by a third party domain outside of our control, it was also a safe and low impact change to make. So since this was a, this was a slightly different proposal, uh, the previous RFC was closed and a new one created, um, explaining all the details and the learnings that I've made um, that I've just explained. So after waiting a week uh, for comments and for feedback, there were no blockers. So nine small pull requests were raised uh, to remove sub-resource integrity from the relevant gov.u applications. At this point, we could start the test, uh, testing the process again. So let's take a look at a few results. So I was also interested in seeing the difference between the two setups, um, HTTP 1.1 with sub-resource integrity versus HTTP 1.1 with no sub-resource integrity in terms of performance. Thankfully, we use um, something called SpeakCurve, which is a fantastic tool to visualize the change in metrics over time. So here's a graph of the homepage um, on a slow mobile. It's a Samsung S3 on a 2G connection. The visually complete metric dropped from 28 seconds to 18 seconds, which is a 36% improvement in this metric. But interestingly, in some cases, we actually saw an increase in the visually complete metric when removing sub resource integrity. So here's an answer page on a Samsung S4 on a 3G connection. At the far right of the graph, um, an increase of just under one second can be seen. So in examining why this is, it's due to the late loading of fonts um, seen in the bottom right in red and the impact this has on the visually complete metric. In the waterfall chart, we can see the browser opening six anonymous TCP connections. They're the green arrows. So the CSS fonts module level four specification states that fonts on a different domain must be downloaded via potentially cause enabled fetch. In other words, an anonymous TCP connection. So when it comes to the font download, the browser has six connections to choose from. Now compare this chart to with sub-resource integrity removed. Um, the browser now has no need to establish all the anonymous TCP connections since all of the assets are being downloaded via a credentialed connection. So when it comes to finally downloading the fonts, only a single anonymous TCP connection has been established. Uh, because of this, the browser has to open another connection at the very last minute to download the second font. This late opening connection blocks the visually cha visual change metric. The way we really need, um, start to see improvements is on the web page test connection view chart. With SRI, we had 13 connections. We had five anonymous connections. We had six credential connections, and we had one third party connection at the bottom that we can ignore. Also note, there's a large orange space after the fonts were loaded at 6.5 seconds. Um, here we can see an inefficiency introduced by domain sharding. The extra connections opened by the browser simply aren't being fully utilized. Now, if we compare that chart to SRI disabled, here we have nine connections. We have two anonymous connections uh, for the fonts, and then we have seven credential connections for all other assets. And you may notice there's a much smaller gap is visible between the connections. Um, this shows that the connections are being used more efficiently by the browser than before. So it's looking better, but it can still be improved. So what about finally switching to HTTP2? So again, um, another graph of the homepage on a slow mobile, a Samsung S3 on a 2G connection. You can see the initial drop from the SRI removal, which is the first line, then an additional drop to, uh, due to enabling H2. So the visually complete metric has dropped from 28 seconds at the start of Dan January down to 14 seconds now, which is a 50% improvement in this metric. 
We even see this one second of the one second uplift that we noticed from the SRI removal on the answers page put fall right back down. So visually complete drops from a peak of 5.7 seconds down to around 4.4 seconds or 23% improvement. So we've seen this dip um, all over our speed curve graphs, even in modern browsers on fast devices. So here we see the page load and fully loaded time drop by 100 milliseconds, even on a very simple page that start uh, like, the st like a start page. Um, now that may not sound like much, but when the page is loading in around one second anyway, that's a 10% improvement on an already quick page. But without a doubt, my favorite chart is a connection view from a web page test. We've gone from 13 TCP connections with HTTP 1.1 and SRI down to two TCP connections with H2. Uh, H2 coalescing can be seen on connection one and the anonymous TCP connection for the fonts is on connection two. There's hardly any empty space uh, on the first connection meaning that the connection is being highly utilized. Uh, the observant among you may even notice the impact of the pre-connect header on the second connection. Uh, the connection is negotiated way before it's actually required by the fonts when they're downloaded. Lastly, uh, let's relook at our summary table. So here's the one from earlier. Lots of unhealthy looking tests where HTTP 1.1 performed better than HTTP 2. And here's the updated table, uh, much healthier looking. There are a few instances and page setups where H1 performs better in some metrics, so I judge them to be performing slightly better, but overall it's much improved. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't test with the iPhone 5C and the Nexus 5 when I was compiling the table uh, because I was having web page test issues at the time. So what's next for web performance on gov.uk? Well, we have a couple of issues um, left to fix in the RFC. Uh, reducing the scope of the course headers is a basic cleanup. Um, there's also the removal of the assets domain um, for our static resources. Um, this will allow us to serve all our CSS, our JavaScript, our images and our fonts off www.gov.uk. So browsers that have a flaky H2 connection coalescing implementation then get the full benefits of H2. Also, the second TCP connection for fonts will no longer be needed resulting in a single TCP connection that can be used for all page assets. This will give the server complete control over the H2 priorities. So Fastly, our CDM provider, have started rolling out TLS 1.3 uh, across their points of presence across the globe. We could see some TLS negotiation improvements uh, when that happens to be switched on in the UK. On top of this, I'd like to investigate the, the use of uh, zero RTT session resumption or uh, RTTs round trip time. Um, this will allow users who visit gov.uk on multiple occasions to use a previous TLS negotiation uh, when connecting. This could remove a fair chunk of time on initial page load, assuming uh, the browser supports it, that is. HTTP3 um, is on the horizon, um, but it's still being developed um, and is in the draft phase at the moment. So there's potential long term gains there as well. So Brotly is a new compression algorithm that is now supported by 92% of browsers globally, according to Can I Use. Um, I've done some research for gov.uk and written a report, and I found that improves file compression of our static assets, that's our HTML, our CSS, and our JavaScript, over the network by 20% compared to our current gzip implementation. Now this is something that Fastly is currently trialing and is in beta, so I'd love to test this out on gov.uk once we get the time. Uh, we're now incredibly close to switching all of our apps to use our new web font, which reduces data required by both by 47% for both fonts, font weights that we use. And finally, the gov.uk team are gradually unpicking and removing our dependencies on jQuery. So we should soon be able to remove another 33 kilobytes of minified and compressed JavaScript across many of our pages. So there you have the story of how H2 was enabled on gov.uk. Um, I learned it wasn't quite as simple as just enabling it, but it was worth the time and investment. Um, we've seen web performance improvements on many pages and devices, including low spec devices on slow connections, and even on high power devices on already quick pages. So no user should be excluded from a government service on the grounds of web performance. Uh, anyone who needs it should be able to access it. 
So enabling H2 and, te and testing to verify it has made a positive difference, has reduced the barrier to entry for many users and improved performance for almost all users. So just a uh, couple of quick thank yous. I'd like to thank uh, Andy Davis and Barry Pollard, um, author of HTTP2 in action. Uh, you would not believe the number of questions I've fired across to them over the past 18 months. So thanks for that. Um, and finally, thanks to the whole of the gov.uk team. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to work with such an incredible bunch of people um, who are always very patient with me whenever I want to make changes. Um, and thanks, thanks for listening, that's that. Thank you.